wrist. Yeah, right leg.
generous, God, to be super generous and not to worry about it, to give out of one hand and not be worried that the other hand would go empty, God, because you are the God of all, and you're the God of our supply, and it's our joy to give to you, God, so bless this offering. Use it to build your kingdom, God. Open up the windows of heaven today and pour out a blessing that we can't contain. But help us to lay down the things that we're holding because you can't pour in the hands that are already full, God. So we greet you this morning. We welcome you into this service and we give this day to you. In your name I pray. Amen.
thank you. I mean, I think sometimes we take for granted our health. I think we take for granted really our wealth. Even those of us who may not have as much as others have more than most in the world. And I just want you for a minute just to think on oh God. When you think on him, I want you just to begin in your heart and mind to whisper your thank you. What do you think? things that he's delivered you from, the things he's going to deliver you from. The things that are mountains today that will be hills tomorrow. Think on him and thank him for him. God, we thank you. We thank you for what you've given us so much more than what we deserve, God. And we open our hearts to receive you. You know, I think we have to be careful um, not to take lightly the things of God, uh, especially us who claim to be Christian. Um, it, it's real easy to live a life that's very mediocre in the mind of the King of God. Just very mediocre, just, oh, I believe. The devil himself believes. Okay? I believe that you are the Son of God. Yes. I believe. But what are you doing with that belief? It's not enough just to merely believe sometimes. We need people who believe and then move. We need people who believe and then love. We need people who believe and then go out and proclaim the gospel. It's not enough. Just, it, yes, I believe and call it on the name of the Lord. Yes, it'll, it'll get you to heaven. But what I'm realizing is that if all I do is I just believe and then I live however I want to, the only thing that I have to bring in heaven is the crowns that he gives me. And I want to bring something. And the only way I'm going to get them is if I earn them while I'm here. And then when I get there, I'll have some kind of currency, some kind of offering to lay down because I can't take anything from here with me. So when I get there, the only thing I'm going to have is whatever he gives me. So if he gives me crowns, I want to have something to lay down in his feet. Okay? If we're going to be a church that's radical, which is what I pray we are, if we're going to be a church that changes the community, and that changes the community in such a way that these walls can't contain us anymore, then we're going to have to be radical, and we're going to have to be powerful, and the only way we're going to do it is to get in the quiet places with God, because what I've realized, and this is not my sermon, so you're getting a little extra this morning, but what I've realized is, is, is that God will shout the things that He wants to get your attention with. He'll shout those things. But if you want revelation, it comes in the whispers of quiet places. If you want him to open up the word to you and reveal who he truly is, it comes in the whispers of quiet places. And you don't get that when distractions are all around you and when you don't take the time to see him. All right, 2 Kings chapter 4 today. We're talking about miracles and we're talking about methods. And it's a powerful thing. Methods. And miracles. And what I've understood about this passage is it comes to me while we're doing our Bible read through, which we're over halfway through with. Yes. Uh, methods and miracles. What I've realized in this passage is that sometimes you've got to change your response if you want to change your results. Even anointed, powerful men of God, it didn't always happen on the first try. And if anointed, powerful, great, holy men of God, the kind of men that you bury their bones in a cave and you throw something dead on them and they come back to life. If, if that's the kind of man and it didn't happen on the first time, then it might not happen for us the first time we pray or the first move that we make. And so sometimes what we're going to have to do is when our miracle doesn't happen, we're going to have to change our method. And I'm going to walk through that today. 2 Kings chapter 4, starting with verse 18. Here we go. When the child had grown, he went out one day. Now this is a child. What has happened is the prophet Elisha has this lady who could not have children, and her husband was very old. She's given a child. He has touched her, and she became pregnant now, and, and she is pregnant with a child because of this, and she has this child. And it says, when the child had grown up, he went out one day to his father among the reapers, and he said to his father, oh, my head, my head. And the father said to his servant, carry him to his mother. And when he had lifted him up and brought him to his mother, the child sat on her lap till noon. And then he died. It don't get much worse than that. And she went up and she laid, she laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door behind him and went out. And then she called to 
telling you, the weaker are going to walk away. The weaker are going to walk away. Those who haven't dug deep into the depths of who God is and know that His promises are yes and amen. And I know that every time that we pray for something, it doesn't come. And I'm not saying name it and claim it and blab it and grab it today. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying sometimes when you try something that doesn't work, you can't try something. Now, the second time, instead of sending someone to do the work for him, Elisha shows up himself. Notice he sent Gehazi ahead the first time. But what happens the second time is Elisha doesn't give up, he shows up. He doesn't give up, he shows up. A lot of us want everyone else to fix it for us. When if we would just show up, our miracle or our breakthrough would come. Haven't you ever been around somebody like that? Where they're like, oh, please do this for me, please do this for me, please do this for me. And you've heard it so many times, finally you're like, just do it yourself. Go get it yourself. A lot of times people come to me for answers, and they want answers for me. And I'm getting my answers from the same place that they are. You know what I'm saying? Or the same place that's available to you. Now, I may have some, some experience that you may not have dealing with maybe a situation, and I may can give you wisdom, but a lot of times we're just reading what is there. <clears throat> and what I realize is when, when Elijah doesn't give up, he shows up, and Elijah now, what he's going to do is he's going to he's going to try something else. And why in the world would he try something else? It's because sometimes you have to change your response to change your results. you got to change it up. Look here. Here we go. We'll go back to verse 32. When Elisha came into the house, he saw the child lying dead on his bed. In other words, it was a hopeless situation. So he went in and he shut the door behind the two of them and he prayed to the Lord. Prayer is always the first place to start. God, what would you have me do? Next, then he went up and he lay on the child, putting his mouth on his mouth. Let me tell you one thing. It's one thing to lay your staff on the child. But it's another thing to lay your staff on. Desperate times call for desperate measures. Sometimes it may take you getting your hands dirty to get the job done. The staff was easy to send. But now he would lay on top of the dead boy, put his mouth to his mouth, and his eyes to his eyes. See, sometimes you've got to get in the middle of the situation to sit in there for And so what he does, his eyes are on his eyes, his hands are on his hands, and he stretched himself upon it. And then all of a sudden, this child has been dead for a while, y'all. The flesh of the child became warm. And then he got up again, and he walked once back and forth in the house. And he went up and he did it again. He stretched himself out on the child. Wow, he's, he's being fervent with what he's doing. He's, he's continuing this path. It's working, so he keeps pushing. If it hadn't worked, he'd have probably changed his method again. But he does. It works. And, so, and then the child sneezed seven times. And please and the child opened his eyes. Then he summoned Gehazi and said, Call the Shunammite. So he called her. And when she came to him, he said, Pick up your son. He had to change his response if he was going to alter his results. <coughs> it's really easy in our Christian walk to just quit when we do not immediately see the response from God we are expecting. Let's just give up. He just doesn't want to do it. He, he's just not concerned. He's just not going to do that. We even do it for other people. Man, you just need to let it go. It's probably not going to happen. Sometimes God says no. I wonder, though, how many times we thought that when the truth was if we would have pushed through, if we would have gotten into it with the situation, that God would have brought warmth back to the body. That God would have brought miracle through the mess up. That he would have brought another method for us to see through. But because our faith wasn't big enough, our outcome wasn't big enough. Sometimes I believe we need to push forward. And it may be like this. You say, well, I prayed about it. Nothing's really happened. But have you fasted? What's the name? I can pray. What else can I do? I can fast. You know what else? Have I brought it to someone else to ask their opinion, to ask their guidance, or to ask them to pray for it? So maybe I, I haven't got any clarity on it. But I bring it to Jamie, and Jamie says, Matt, it's so weird that you ask me this. I dream this about you, and here's the answer. That happens. I've had it happen. I've had people come to me and tell me things that I couldn't get clarity on, that I couldn't get wisdom on. But I had to go and ask them, and when I asked them, they told me, they said, it's funny that you didn't ask me that. Have you prayed? Yes, I prayed. Have you fasted? No, I haven't fasted, but I'm going to. Well, have you carried it to somebody else? No, no. What am I doing? I can't figure out my miracle, so I've got to figure out. 
change. I remember a scene in the Chronicles of Narnia, if you've ever seen the movie Prince Caspian, and Lucy is talking to Aslan in the, in the forest. And Aslan says this. He said, things never happen the same way twice. Things never happen the same way twice. See, nothing always works the second time as it did the first time. Because if it did, then every demon that the disciples came to, they would have been able to cast out. But do you remember the story? Look here. This is Matthew chapter 17. Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and sore vexed. For oft times he falleth into the fire and off into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Hmm. They've cast out demons before. They've performed miracles before. But the disciples can't cure him. And then Jesus answered and said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him. And the child was cured from that hour. Then he came to his disciples, then the disciples came to Jesus apart and said, Why could we not cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your, because of your unbelief, belief. for verily I say to you, if you have faith, as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall move, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Look, 21, how be it this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. In other words, Jesus looked at them, and he said, You know what? You want another miracle? you got to try another method. Everything doesn't work the same way twice. This one doesn't come out simply by casting him out, by speaking to him. You might have to go a little further than that. And you might have to deny your flesh so that you can take on something. You get rid of something natural in order to take on something supernatural. Fasting is powerful, but it ain't easy. <laughs> How many of you love to fast? Some of you wish you wasn't fasting right now. Just being in here is a fast for you. And so, you know, it's, it's, we're, we're already thinking, we're like, man, if they'll finish early, I can get there before the people do, and I can get my food faster. Fasting doesn't mean faster food. I wish it did. <laughs> what I'm realizing, though, is fasting often breaks bondage. Having problems in your marriage? Fast for your mate. If you're not willing to do that, what are you willing to do? Having problems with your children? Fast for your children. Deny your flesh so that your spirit can be strong. It's not easy, but it does work. And Jesus is telling his disciples, sometimes you have to change your method to see your miracle. And some of you have been trying the same old things for years, and you can't win the battle. You can't get the breakthrough. And maybe it's time to do something as simple as this. Just change your method. He said, I've been trying this for years and years and years. And I'm like, well, what? good for you to try something different. What could it hurt? What could it hurt? If it's not happening anyway, why not change another approach? If Elisha has to change another approach, if the disciples have to change their approach, how different are we? We keep trying to do something the same way, yet it's never worked. Or we keep trying to do something the same way we once did it. Because it worked back then. And the whole time what we don't realize is all the other factors surrounding our issue have changed. And the response that once yielded results one time before may not yield the result, the same results this time. It's like me trying something with Elijah when he was a kid, and, or when he was a baby, and that's where I need to come in and she comes up. Yes, it's, it's the same parents. Yes, it's one of our children. But the outcome is totally different. I see y'all shaking your head because you know they're not the same. The things surrounding the circumstance are not the same. Although they are both my flesh and blood, one is totally different than the other. And their response is totally different than the other. Uh, uh, Elijah, you know, last night, he comes in there because, he, you know, it's the end of the night. And he's talking to me about a spider coming out from under his mattress. And that there's baby spiders coming out from his mattress. Which was not true. There was a small spider there. And then Hosanna, she's had a poor outfit in the bathtub because uh, the Elsa soap got in her eye, and you'd have thought I shot her. I mean, she was screaming. I couldn't do anything for her. I mean, it was like blood curdling screaming, like, like the worst of the worst. It, 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 and then you just can't deal with two situations. They can't be dealt with the same way. Although, yes, I am the parent. Although, yes, they are my child. The situation has changed. And oftentimes in the church, we'll run up on the same situation and we'll try to 
do it the same way that we used to, and then when it doesn't work, we act surprised. But all what we don't understand is all of the situation may look the same. All the factors surrounding it are different. They're different. You know what used to work to reach teenagers when I was a teenager doesn't work often now because all the factors have changed. Everything's been put into fast forward and they know more than they used to know. And they think they know even more than that. <laughs> <laughs> That's the reality of it. It's the factors have changed. And so we're constantly having to reinvent ourselves. We're changing new methods. And time has changed. People have changed. And circumstances have changed. And Jesus demonstrated this when he healed three, he had the blind, he had blind people, blind men, and three different times while he was here on earth. But yet he healed them and he never used the same method. He never used the same method. Let me show you what I'm talking about here. Three times Jesus healed the blind, three miracles, three different methods. Now why did Jesus have to do three different methods? I have no idea. I have no idea. But he did. He did it three different ways. Look here, uh, the man born blind from John chapter 9. He spits and makes mud and then places it on the man's eyes and tells him to wash his eyes in the pool of Siloam. Now some of you have been out. You're going, no, nah, I'm good. I'll be blind. Uh, he spits in the mud, rubs it on their eyes. I don't know. Why, why would he do that? I don't know. Blind Bartimaeus, Mark chapter 10. The man says he wants to see. Jesus tell him his faith is healed him and he immediately is able to see. He said, you may have to touch him. doesn't do anything. doesn't spit in mud. doesn't pop on his eyes. doesn't tell him to go wash him. I don't know why it's different. Two blind men, uh, Matthew chapter 20, two blind men call out to Jesus. It says that he touched their eyes and they could see. doesn't say he spit and made mud. doesn't say that he talked to them. It just says that he touched their eyes and they could see. Why would he try three different methods? I don't know, but it was three different miracles and he did three different ones. I guess sometimes there's a different method for a different miracle. Now, can't he do it any way he wants to? He did. But he chose to do it this way. And all I can do is look at the word and go, okay, sometimes there's a different method for a different miracle. And so what I'm learning is each healing was done a different way. Another miracle, another method. So there's going to be times when there's things that are going on that, that we just have to change our way. Well, another thing that I've learned about the miracle process is that we have to be careful not to mock the method. Not to mock the method. Because sometimes we pray for things and God answers it. We go, I don't like the way you answer. I need this breakthrough, and you get the breakthrough, but it comes in a way where you're like, ugh, I didn't expect it this way. I didn't think it would happen this way. God, grow me, and then you got something really difficult, and you're like, ugh, that's what I was talking about, God. Take me to another level, God, and you think you're going to have this big, powerful moment in praise and worship, and you're just going to go to another level, but then you go through a season of hardship, and then you go, okay, this ain't exactly what I had planned. What I want to show you here is uh, 2 Kings, go to chapter 5. Sometimes we get so discouraged by the waiting that we mock the method that our healing can come through. Don't so mock the method. 2 Kings chapter 5. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him to say to him, Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored.
See, we can't ask God for a miracle and then mock the method through which he provides it. And it's times like, it, it, it's like this, the time that there was a flood. Do you remember? I mean, maybe you heard this story. There was a flood, and there was a man, and he, 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 it started, the water started coming around his house. And so he climbed up on the roof of his house, and he was, he was standing there, and it was, the waters were getting deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And as the waters got deeper and they rose up, he, uh, he stood there, and he prayed to God. He said, God, he said, save me from this flood. It's getting deep. And then all of a sudden, a boat comes by. And the man says, hey. Come on down. Let me carry you away from the flood waters. He says, no, no, no. God's going to save you. And the waters rise up. Now they're above his car. It's getting pretty serious. It's starting to look like CNN on here, okay? We're, we're in a lot of action. And so he's up there, and the, the boat goes by. He says, hey, man, it's getting bad. you got to come on. We got, we're here to get you. Come on down. And then the other rescue boat, here it is. He says, climb on down. And he says, no, no, no. God is going to save me. Then it goes on a little while later. It's already up to the roof now. And he's just got a little bit of room left. And a helicopter flies over as the coast guard. And they say, hey, we're sending a basket down. Get on. And he says, no, I'm good. God's going to save me. And, you know, they have no option at this point, so they leave him. And the man drowns, and he dies. And he gets to heaven, and he's like, God, why didn't you save me? Why didn't you help me? And he said, I sent two boats and a helicopter. What more do you want? And we're the same way, though. We want our miracle. We're holding on. Oh, God, give me that miracle. And he says, here's a way for you to get it. Here's a way for you to get it. Here's a way for it to happen. And we're going, no, I don't want that way, God. I want you to come down and do it my way. I want it to be my way. See, it's easy to mock the methods when it's packaged in a way you're not expecting. It's easy to mock them when, we, when it comes in a way that we didn't expect it. Why do you want that, God? And he's saying it may be the greatest joy of your life to get this way. God, I went this way. And you say, it may be the greatest joy of your life to get this way. Haven't you seen it, though, in a parent that, that couldn't have a child, and, and they, they want a child, and, and, they, and they beg God for a child, and they never were able to have it naturally, but then they adopt, and they have an op opportunity for something like that, and it's the greatest joy and they looked at me. And every time, it seems to me, for me, adoption is this huge thing to me because it's like I just see God taking me on. When I look at somebody, an adoptive parent taking on a child that's not theirs, it's like, man, God took me on. I didn't know. And it's this great joy of their life. But sometimes we miss that. We miss it. And I know it's not for everybody. But what I'm saying is it's easy to mock the method when it's not packaged in the way that we're expecting. And we pray. It's like we pray for patience. And then our patience is tested. And we get angry. Why? Because God didn't give us patience. He gave us a chance to learn patience. What are, you, what are you asking for but refusing because it's not coming in a package that you expected to receive? Think about that. Oh, God, kill my marriage. And he's like, okay, I'm going to do it, but this is what it's going to take. I don't want to do that, God. Okay, your marriage probably won't be any. <laughs> He says, he says, heal my marriage, God. And God says, okay, serve your wife. Get under her. Make yourself lowly. Show her who you are through your servanthood to her. And he said, no, I'll never do that. I'll never, my pride will never do that. And then you're divorced and you're going, how did this happen? And God said, I would have done it through that. You remember the movie, uh, was it Fireproof? I believe that was the one. You know, he was terrible. He was pretty awful, had a lot of bad habits. And then God said, do this. Here is an option. He starts serving his wife. You know, and he goes, like, like 40 days or whatever it is. And he flips through, and he flips through, and he flips through, and he flips through. And he's, every day he's done something. At first, it's kind of, it's frustrating to him because she doesn't respond. And it takes him more than the amount of days that his dad told him to do it. What day are you on? It's like, I don't know, I'm like 60-something. Let's, let's go 40. I don't know. I don't remember how many days it is. But it's like, it's like, and then she realized that he was willing to do that. And she was willing. And see, our miracle may not come the way that we think it should. Next is, are you preparing to receive your miracle? Are you, are, are you preparing to receive it? Jesus begins his work in Peter's life by demonstrating miracles. You remember, you know, Peter's out there and he's fishing, and Jesus comes on the boat with him. I'll show you what I mean here in just a second. But Peter had to be prepared to receive the miracle. Look here, Luke chapter 5, 
It says, one day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. And he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, and the one belonging to Simon, or Peter, and asked him to put out a little from shore. And then he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. Why? Because he could get over the boat. It had this acoustic effect. It would just project over the water. And then that way people weren't crowding. And then when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into a deep water and let the nets down for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. And this is a great statement about who Peter was. He said, but because you say so, I'll let down the nets. And when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that the nets began to break. They caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. Can you imagine? I've never had a day like that catching fish. If you can have the complete opposite, my boat actually lifted higher because of how little fish we had. Uh, that, that's the kind of days that I have. But he starts with a miracle. The story about Peter casting his nets on the other side and catching all those fish would not have been near as impressive or powerful if Peter had went out that morning with only a crab net. If he would have went out with a crab net that morning, then he would have only been able to fill the crab net. you got to prepare for your miracles. It's what you do before the miracle happens that often determines how big the miracle is. See, Peter prepared for a big return long before the fish were nearby. Peter looked out ahead, and when Jesus came aboard, he changed Peter's method. Peter had fished all night. When Jesus showed him, he was just fishing in the wrong place. Cast your nets on the other side. In other words, change your method, Peter. And when Peter was obedient, his miracle came. And he actually caught more than he could contain. But listen to this. He was only limited by the amount he had planned for. They had two boats. They filled two boats. They had three boats. They had four boats, they filled four boats. You're only limited by what you expect. Caught more than he had planned for. This morning, are you waiting on a miracle? Have you prepared to receive it? Next, I, I would hate to know, I, I caught only a few fish when I could have caught hundreds simply because I didn't have enough faith to pick a bigger net. And this is what I realized, is that it's hard to cast vision sometimes because logic will tell you to bring the zip code 33 when God is telling you to bring out the big nets. Oh, I, I, I don't catch very big fish. I'll just carry this little zip code reel up or whatever out there. I'll catch my little bass and I'll be fine. And God's saying, no, why don't you get a net? And why don't you scatter it? And why don't you get a bank of them? And why don't you go get them? And I'm going to carry you out there. What we're going to do, we're going to, instead of fishing on the right side, we're going to fish on the left side. And when we do, because you prepared, what we're going to do, we're going to have so many fish that's going to break the nets. And you were prepared for a zip code, but I'm prepared for a net. However big your faith is, is how big of a net you're bringing. And that happens in churches. We've got to cast a big one. We've got to get a big vision. We don't want to be limited by our size. We don't want to be limited by that. We've got to cast a big vision. Because what happens is you'll always prepare for what you intend to catch. Preparation is always riding on the back of expectation. If you think you got 30 coming to a party, you might prepare for 35. But if 50 show up, you'll be in a world of hurt, right? Because you all preparation is always riding on the back of expectation. If I expect this many, it'll come. So if I'm always expecting five and God's wanting to give me a hundred, I'm in a bad place. I want to make sure I cast a, a, a net big enough. And I'm not limiting God by what God can do, but only what I can believe Him to do. And I don't want to mock His method, and I don't want to minimize return. By diminishing my expectations. I want to maximize my miracle by strengthening my surplus. Big net, catch big fish. This is the, we're rounding out third here, guys. You followed me good this morning, and I appreciate it. Diminished thinking yields diminished return. Diminished thinking yields diminished return. Do you remember the parable of the talents in Matthew chapter 25? Jesus said, a man gave one of his servants five talents, another two talents, and another one. 
And when he came back, the one with five had produced five more. And the one with two had produced two more. So let's look here at what the one with one talent did. And then the man who had received one bag of gold came. And master, he said, I knew you were, you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown, and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See here is what belongs to you. In other words, I'm giving you the one bag that you gave me. And as his master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I would harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put money, uh, put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one with, who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. And whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw the worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. See, he thought small. So even what he had was what was given to him was taken away. And I don't want my diminished thinking to yield my diminished return. See, you can't limit God through under expectation. Because there's two things that can happen here. We can limit God in our faith by what he can do. Or we can limit God in our faith by what we think he will do. And both of them are just as bad. Oh, I don't know if God can do that. That's bad. He can do it all. I don't know if God will do that. That's not for you to decide. Stop trying to make decisions out of your pay grade. I'm just going to believe that he will. And he can do what he wants to from there. Because it's never about what God can do. It's about what we can believe him to do. Jesus said that all things are possible to him that believe it. And sometimes we may need to change our method. We may need to be careful not to mock the method when it comes packaged in a way we're not expecting. And we may need to prepare for our miracle, making sure we've created a, big, a space big enough for the return that God wants to give us. But what I know is diminished thinking yields diminished return. And sometimes you have to change your response if you're going to change your results. Randy, you can come. Uh, you have to ask yourself this morning, is, what am I preparing for? What am I preparing for? What am I wanting God to do? Number one, what am I wanting God to do in my own life personally? Next, what am I wanting God to do in my family? And next, what am I wanting God to do in this church? What am I, what am I wanting God to do in my job? And how do those things line up with what God already wants to do? And then am I believing, am I having enough faith to see those things come to pass? Let's stand together this morning. You may be standing on the edge of your bricks group, but you may need to just change your method. I'll fast. I'll pray. I'll ask God to some others. I'll listen to what God has, because he may whisper it to me in moments of revelation when it's just him. As they sing this morning, I would open the altar, the altar this way, where if you are, are, have been waiting on God to move in your life in a certain way, in a certain form, in a certain fashion, that you would come and you would ask him and say, God, what can I do to get in line with what you already wanted to do? Because it's not about what you can do, God, but it is about what I can believe in. And sometimes my miracle is hinged upon how I respond to what you already offer. we got to believe bigger. If nothing else this morning, I'd ask you to pray for this church, that we would cast our net wide now, that we would believe God for the big change. That we would have people in here who were big thinkers, big risks, roll the dice, get it done kind of people that would believe that God can do exceedingly abundantly above all else that we could ever ask or think. That we wouldn't say, oh God, 500 is, would be a lot for us. No, that we would say, God, as many as you want to bring, let the boats be weighed down. Let us call for our friends to help. That we would see all of you come to know. And that we'd be big enough to believe it this morning. As they sing all through the
Thank you for being here today. Check on those who weren't here. 